welcome back to my channel. My name is Jenny. I'm a naturalist and an educator that focuses on reptiles. Snakes are one of my favorite animals in the world. And so I find learning all about how they work and how they move absolutely fascinating. And other people find that stuff pretty fascinating too sometimes. And in my line of work, I actually get a lot of questions regarding whether or not snakes have bones. So this is something that some people are confused about. And basically you can think of a snake as sort of like a tube. It's just basically a tube with a head, but they do have bones. All snakes are vertebrates. Vertebrates have bones. There are no boneless snakes in the entire world. Their skeleton is mostly made up of vertebra and ribs. And depending on the species, they can have anywhere from 200 to 400 pairs of vertebra and ribs. So when you're looking at a snake, you're basically mostly looking at the vertebra and rib structure going all the way down the body until you get down to where the tail is. And depending on the species too, the tail can be different lengths. So this species is a Colombian rainbow boa. Oh, Violet, no. <laughs> so this is her cloaca and from this point down is where her tail is some species will have longer tails some species will have shorter tails it just depends on the structure of that individual species so snakes don't have shoulder girdles but some species do retain a vestigial or basically ancient pelvic girdle and so boas like violet here the Colombian rainbow boa Pythons, pipe snakes, and blind snakes typically have a vestigial pelvic girdle. Now a snake's skull is adapted to, to basically deal with swallowing large prey. Over time, they have developed certain adaptations such as a brain uh, completely encased in bone to protect it from um, possibly struggling prey that's being swallowed. Another adaptation that they have in their skull is basically very flexible joints in between bones of the skull and on the back side of their skull I'm going to show you a picture here in a second they have a quadrate bone that basically acts as a double hinged joint which allows them to open their jaw very wide and in addition to being able to open their jaw very wide they also have a very stretchy ligament in the front of their jaw in between the two jaw bones and so they can open very wide because of the quadrate bone, but the two halves of their jaw can also spread very wide to accommodate large prey because of that stretchy ligament, ligament excuse me, in between their two jawbone halves. And like their skulls, the teeth of snakes have actually developed over time into different specialized modifications that basically help them conquer prey or be uh, better able to kill or immobilize their prey. And so most snakes can be placed into four groups based on their type of teeth or dentition that the snake has. So Aglyphus species of snakes like rainbow boas right here, look violet, they don't rely on venom modifications with fangs to help subdue prey. They either rely on constriction or they just swallow their prey whole while it's still alive and kicking. So Epistoglyphus snakes have a modification that gives them two enlarged teeth at the back of the mouth. And these two enlarged teeth are designed to work venom into their prey. So they're not really designed for quick injections of venom like with uh, the pit vipers, which we'll talk about in a second. And some of the species that are Epistoglyphus are uh, snakes like boomslangs and uh, garter snakes too. And I actually have these two little scars on the back of my hand right here. And these scars are actually from a, an eastern garter snake that had actually worked its rear fangs into my hand. And some people have uh, no reaction to the extremely mild venom of garter snakes, but I definitely felt a reaction from it. It was a very marked reaction. Um, there was slight throbbing, um, itchiness, it even uh, got red and swelled up just a little bit on the back of my hand. So um, while garter snakes can be considered rear fang snakes, they're, like I said, their venom's extremely mild. Some people have no reaction to it. And they're not considered medically significant as a venomous snake. So that's why when you think of a garter snake, you, they're not venomous snakes in the medical significance of their venom. Proteroglyphous snakes like cobras have enlarged fangs that basically act as a hollow needle and inject venom through the center of the fang. However, most cobras and other proteroglyphous snakes have very short fangs. 
Now, the last and most well-known group of snakes in regards to their dentition are the selenoglyphus snakes. Selenoglyphus snakes have two large fangs that fold up against the roof of the mouth when they're at rest, and they swing out when the snake is ready to bite and inject venom. And these snakes are the vipers. Uh, here in where I live in Georgia, we actually have five different species of pit vipers, and all five are, like I said, selenoglyphus. They have long hollow fangs that act as a hypodermic needle that are folded against the roof of the mouth at rest. They swing out when ready to bite, and they're designed to inject large amounts of venom very quickly. And the fangs themselves are very long and typically curved, and so if um, a prey animal, such as a uh, rat, were bitten by a selenoglyphus snake, those fangs allow the snake to very quickly inject a large amount of venom and they tend to bite and then release and then they'll track down the scent of their prey item after that animal has been overcome by the power of the venom. And so these snakes are particularly dangerous to humans if they do feel the need to bite because of that ability to inject large amounts of venom very easily and very quickly. So, especially around pit vipers, we have to be careful. Um, and I've already talked about this in my last uh, reptile roundup video, but it's also important to keep in mind that snakes don't want to bite. Snakes bite if they feel threatened and if they feel the need to defend themselves. So, especially with pit vipers, it's important to give them space and respect and also respect the fact that they do have that ability to inject large amounts of venom very quickly and very easily due to the structure of their large fangs. And as far as snake hearing goes, snakes don't have external ears the same way that we do, but they do have bones similar to our bones inside their skull. And these bones are designed basically to facilitate the sense of hearing in the same way. It's just not nearly as powerful as our sense of hearing. So humans can hear up to about 20,000 hertz, but in comparison, a snake typically can only hear to around 600 to 700 hertz. And an example for that would be um, the human voice is around 250 hertz on average, so a snake can hear the voice of a human, and Violet most likely cannot hear crisp, clear sounds of my voice, despite the fact that I'm talking right next to her she would hear more of a muffled sound of my voice. And so snakes don't rely on their sense of hearing as much as they rely on their sense of smell. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video today. I hope you got to learn something new. If you enjoyed the video, I'm, I'm always happy to see comments down below, so please leave me a comment. And in regards to snake hearing, I love this topic, so I'm gonna go more in depth into that in another video. But as for right now, if you have any questions for me regarding snake anatomy or any other, you know, questions about the topic of snakes or reptiles in general, please leave me a comment. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time. Bye!